Welcome back. Raising kids as Muslims in North America is no easy feat. We are constantly dealing with challenges within our own communities and academic institutions. But how can we overcome these issues and use them as opportunities to truly teach kids to love Islam and pride themselves for their Muslim identity? Joining me to discuss this very interesting topic is Hina Mirza. Hina is the co-editor and lead writer of the Islamic Society of North America's online Canadian publication called Isna Lanterns and also serves as the vice chair for the Media Communications Committee for Isna Canada. Let's get her thoughts on this issue. Welcome to the show, Hina. Assalamualaikum. Thank you for having Alaykum me. Salam. So Hina, can you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, specifically in, in as it relates to writing about parenting? Yes, absolutely. So Isna Lanterns likes to write about topics that are relevant to people living in North America, specifically in Canada. And one of the issues that we've noticed that has come up a lot is raising children in Canada or, you know, how do you parent? And I find it really interesting that we need to be qualified to do any job in the world except for parenting that kind of just falls that you just have that. to do it absolutely <laughs> um, nobody's gonna ask you for certification nobody's gonna ask for your qualification but it's not as easy uh, said than done when you actually become a parent there is so much to think about and the really amazing thing about parents these days is that they're looking to be informed they're looking to be educated they want to know what's the best choice possible for my child which is where our publication comes into place now um, lanterns does cover a number of issues but I am sort of focused on writing for parents and having to work with that demographic and dealing with their issues. And you yourself are a parent as well, so you I have am. experience there. <laughs> yes, a little bit. I've got I've got three children and um, they go through a lot of the ages 11, 8, and 6, so Perfect. I get to see it so all. Perfect, so you have a good array. So can you tell me a little, a little bit about, you know, Muslim parents are facing challenges. Uh, tell me a little bit about that. What, what do you think from your perspective are some of these challenges as it relates to educational institutions? Well, for starters, we want to help our children build a good identity. We want them to be good Muslims, but we want them to be stronger members in the community as well. And that's a lot of pressure on parents to create a multi-dynamic, multifaceted human being. Um, it's an incredible challenge. So what do you do? How do you begin? How do you instill Canadianness but not let go of the Muslimness in a child? So facing that particular issue is always going to be very important to parents and then not to mention all the academic issues that they're coming across now in public schools with the whole curriculum issue it's a lot to take in. Tell me a little bit about um, you know experiences and I guess your perspective on public schools some parents you know contemplate Islamic schools some are contemplating homeschooling how do you address all of that as you mentioned when you're talking about this idea of Canadianness and Muslimness? Yeah the fantastic thing is that there are options out there and that's one thing that as people we just need to be very grateful that we have options. Definitely. There was a time and day when there weren't choices you had to do what the system kind of in your lap and you had to work with it. Parents nowadays are given choices and they're given options and they can work with what works best for their family. And I can't insist enough how individual this decision is. I know that there is a lot of conversation about, you know, should I choose public school? Should I do homeschooling? Is Islamic school better? Um, I want to demystify that completely and I want, I, I want that myth to get out, you know, to throw that myth out because there is no right answer. I have so many parents who will come up to me at the end of workshops and say, Sister Hannah, just tell me, you know, what should I do with my child? Should I send them to Islamic school? Should I start homeschooling them? And I tell them, I say, you know what, just take a deep breath. The first thing, credit yourself for being a good parent first because you are so concerned about your child's outcome that you are focusing on their education. You know, what form of education is going to be the best? So that, that's, that's a great first step to take. Of course. Um, being a concerned parent is definitely the right step and so second issue is which avenue should you take that's always going to be so individual depending on your financial status depending on whether you know the mother feels comfortable being around the kids all day long and I know it sounds horrible but you know I mean it's entirely such an individual decision to make what kind of support system do you have what kind of opportunities are you a working mom is a father also working all of these pieces of the puzzle have to come together in order to make the right choice and let me assure you that there is no bad choice out there um, you will never find a parent who will actively sit and say, I really want to mess my child up, <laughs> so I'm going to put them in public Definitely. school. Or, you know what, I'm going to homeschool because I don't want my child to have social skills. You are never going yes. to find a parent is who is trying to come up with the worst outcome for their child. Every parent, with their best interest at heart, wants to do what is right for their children. 
And we as individuals and as a community, we need to learn to be respectful of everyone's choices and we need to learn to be kind. Um, I see a lot of uh, a lot of parents who are, um, you know, they're just adamant that homeschooling is the best option and that's the best thing you can do. And when they meet a public school parent, they'll, you know, they'll look down upon them and they'll say, "I can't believe you're ruining your child's future. You know, you're not concerned about how your child is going to be. This is the worst thing possible." I wish we would stop doing that to each other. Um, understand and love and care and show that kind of level of respect and kindness. So let's, I know you mentioned a little bit about the topic that's um, on everyone's radar, the sex ed curriculum. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about, um, I guess, your perspectives. In another article that uh, you wrote about public schools, you said that, you know, th the ways that we can teach children um, to really become accepting is help them teach that there is a beautiful balance that can be created in North America within the schools. But how are we going to create this balance when parents, especially with the sex ed curriculum, are, f are they themselves are not feeling the balance? So what's your... Okay. And that's a very loaded question, but <laughs> go for lot, it. There are a lot of pieces <laughs> to that question. Hopefully I'll get them all. So I'm going to tell you what I tell all my parents every time I do a workshop. Um, I tell them that this new curriculum is a blessing in disguise. And alhamdulillah, thank you, God, for having sending us this curriculum. Because Muslim parents, um, and I'm not trying to stereotype here, I'm just generalizing a statement. It's not about everybody. A lot of Muslim parents were never involved in their child's education. They would ship their children off to school, and they have nothing to do with what's happening for that eight hours while the kids are outside of the house. This curriculum has literally taken a gigantic spotlight and put it on their child's education. And that's fantastic. For the first time, you're going to see Muslim moms mom's concerned about what are they reading to my child at school. You're going to have fathers saying, who's my child's teacher? What are they learning? What are the discussion topics? You know, I mean, all of these conversations are happening. Now, uh, we all know that the curriculum and the health phys ed curriculum has always existed. There has been some elements of it that have always been present. That's th Nothing has changed. That's not new. What's new is the new dimensions that they've added to it, maybe perhaps even opened up the conversation a little bit. Now, um, again, you know, I'm going to try to make sure that I get everything because that, that question was quite loaded with all information. Um, one of the things is that children living in North America or anywhere, actually, are going to be exposed to information. Yes. You have to accept that. You have to understand it. The question is, when are they going to be exposed? Now, um, you know, perhaps maybe if you put your child in public school, that information comes to them sooner. If you're homeschooling, you're delaying the process of that information. So as a parent, I want in to encourage everybody, don't worry about what information they're going to come across. Worry about when they come across it, what are they going to do with it? We have to teach our children to have appropriate responses. And you know, Islam has a wonderful way of creating those positive, appropriate responses wherever and whenever they come across them. Um, my children are, uh, they're very young. I've got a student, I've got a child in kindergarten, I've got a child in grade two, and then I've got a daughter in grade five right now. So you'll have my kindergartner, um, you know, he's asking me certain questions um, about the way his teacher might be dressed. And it's the summer, you know, wardrobes change. And he's five. Well, he was five at the time. And I would tell him, I would say, it doesn't matter what the other person is doing. What are you doing in response to what they are doing? Focus on that. Focus on yourself. Let's not point fingers or say, oh, but so-and-so said this, or so-and-so dressed like that, or so-and-so believes this, or so-and-so, you know, I mean, even when you want to talk about homosexuality or gender identity, it doesn't matter. That is irrelevant. What's important is your communication with your child, teaching them appropriate responses is your responsibility. Can you share an example? I know when we were talking out there, you mentioned your child had actually come to you and asked a question. Yes, so um, that infamous pink day always happens mm -hmm. and something or the other has to come up. Um, my daughter was read a book on gender identity and it was a very well-written children's book about how a boy wanted to dress like a girl and they completely um, made it look like, hey, it's okay. And the whole idea that was being pushed in the book was that there's no such thing as girls and boys. We're all equal. And to a certain extent, I understand what the message is supposed to be, but the delivery of it was so inappropriate because the boy wants to wear a tangerine colored dress and wants it to be acceptable and wants it to be okay. So, um, you know, I communicate with my kids a lot. I encourage a lot of conversation um, just to kind of find out what's happening at school and what, what, how they're processing the information. So my daughter comes home and I'm asking her questions about what had happened and she tells me about this story that she read. And um, internally, 
my brain is, <laughs> oh my God, I can't believe they read this to her. Um, but you know, I am my and game And how old phase. was she at the time? She's eight. Oh, she she's was eight. eight. Okay. Yeah, this year. It happened this year. Okay. But um, in front of her, I've got my mommy face on. Yes. And I'm like, oh, and then tell me what happened because you want more information. She's going to watch this in like 20 years <laughs> and figure <laughs> out my secret. It's okay. <laughs> but anyways, so, um, you know, uh, I've got my mommy face on and I'm um, like, tell me more. So then what happened and then what happened? Bottom line is the entire story was about gender equality and there's no such thing as boy stuff and girl stuff. Um, we had that conversation. I let her, you know, just kind of spill it all out. And then I started asking her really, um, you know, probing questions. And I said, well, that's really interesting that, you know, girls can do everything boys can do and boys can do everything girls can do. But why don't, I'm a little confused. I've never seen a boy have a baby in his belly. Like that's never happened. Have you ever seen that happen? And so she's sitting there and she's like, no, I've never seen that. And I was like, yeah, boys don't give birth to babies. Only girls give birth to babies. I let that idea sit in her head for a bit. And she's thinking, she's like, oh my God, that's right. Boys yeah. can't have babies. Okay. And then I said to her, I said, you know, another thing I was thinking was boys can't feed babies from their bodies. Um, you know, I mean, I know some parents might find these questions inappropriate, but my children, I, I make sure that these, yeah. you know, they understand. They know the truth of where things are happening. As long as it's appropriately delivered, they know the truth. So I said to her, I said, you know, um, boys don't feed their babies from their bodies. Only mommies can feed b their babies. That's interesting. It's you just told me that girls can do everything boys can do, and boys can do everything girls can do. I don't think that's true. Do you think that's true? And all of a sudden, it was like a light bulb went off in her head, and she's like, you're right, Mom. It's not possible. And so once I had solidified that basic ground rule, like, you know, your idea of girls and boys are equal is not correct, then I went into phase two, and I said, well, you tell me something. You know, I mean, I'm just curious to know what your thoughts are about this, that if there was a lot of snow on the driveway, and we needed to shovel it, and we've got a huge driveway, and I was like, if we needed to shovel it, who's the better person for that job? And so she, you know, it took her like a split second. She's like, Dad. And I was like, why? And she's like, because he's stronger. And I said, yeah, you're right. I wouldn't want to shovel the whole driveway. I think your dad <laughs> definitely is the better person for the job. And then I said to her that, you know, you know, on days where you're sick and you've got tummy aches and you want to stay home from school, who would you rather have stay home with you? Would you rather have Daddy stay home or would you have rather have Mommy stay home? And she's like, of course, I want Mommy to stay home because you give me good hugs and you take care of me. And, you know, I mean, I don't want to step on anyone's toes when it comes to feminism because I know this is a big issue. And Islam is a religion that really promotes, you know, I'm not going to say gender equality. That's incorrect. But every gender having their own place in this yes. world. And that's something that I want parents to start teaching their children. Even as a society, and I'm not talking about Muslims or non-Muslims, I'm talking about as a society, we need to understand that there's some things that guys are great at doing and some things that women are great at doing. We're not trying to compete with one another. We're trying to learn to appreciate one another and let each other live in our spaces and so that we can grow. Yes. yes, grow as a society. That's where positiveness is going to come in. So, you know, I mean, parents across the way, teach your children you don't have to be equal. You can do stuff that other, you, you know, if, as long as it comes to playing sports, as long as it comes to, you know, learning and academics and anything else, have, what have you. Teach your children that they can progress in a similar fashion, but understanding that they have their own space in life, girls versus boys. Let's not try to blend the two because they weren't meant to and be the compete, same. And compete, because you're not going to get No, anywhere. you're not going to compete. I mean, you know, I tell my son, you have to learn to respect your sisters. Your sisters have a specific role that they are going to be fulfilling in our home, and you have to respect it. Similarly, I tell my daughters the same thing about my son. He has a specific role that he is fulfilling in our family, and we have to learn to love him and respect that role. Don't, don't. Don't try to do that. Don't try to say that I want to do what he's doing because he's a boy. No, yeah. that, that, that's confusing and will remain confusing. And I think that as we've seen in the world today, once we open up those doors, there, there's, it's hard then to define the lines and say, okay, well, you know, I'm a woman, I want respect, but I want to be treated with kindness. So that's, you know, then you go to a whole other yeah. conversation. This was definitely very interesting. Thank you very much, Hannah. You're welcome.